Today, we have a very special guest. Gonna talk about the mob, drugs, and a little known group that many have not heard of, the Purple Gang. When you think of the Purple Gang, you think of Detroit. But not many people know about the Purple, Purple Gang in NYC. Today's author is gonna tell us all about it. Hello, Tom Lebecki here with the latest edition of the Armchair NBA. Before we get started, just want to point out the new stuff in the merch store. Um, I designed this myself. This is the Armchair NBA Italia unisex shirt. Get that for your father for Father's Day. We got the new flat rim hat in. Already got some orders for that. For those on the go, the new waterproof travel bag. One of my favorites, I call this the k Fi. You know, just do this. People will understand. Um, a few more that I like. Unpack this for those that watch the show is my jam. And then inspired by RJ Roger, the My Wife Hates Me shirt. So check it out. Helping out uh, the show. A good way to do that is get some merch, cop some merch. And it's a great way to get some cool gear as well as help out the show. Today's guest is Scott Ditchy, the author of... Hitmen, Mafia, Drugs, and the East Island Purple Gang. And he's a Jersey guy. Scott, <laughs> welcome to the Armchair NBA. How are you doing today? Good. Doing well. Thanks again for having me on. It's my pleasure. Always good to see Scott. We keep in touch. Um, and mm -hmm. I was waiting for this release. I got the book. I'm, I'm in the process of reading it. Um, so let's start off. I am like there's rabbit holes and there's kind of I call blind spots. First, we go blind spots first. Mm -hmm. I consider the Purple Gang in New York City a blind spot for the people that are mobologists because they kind of know like the five families. They know, you know, the Purple Gang in Detroit. Maybe they go to the secondary cities like L.A. and that kind of stuff. But the Purple Gang is not so well known. So that's why I call it a blind spot. And it's going to be a rabbit hole because once you kind of go down this rabbit hole, you're like, holy cow, this is some serious stuff. So, Scott, first, let's start off. Who was a Purple Gang in East Harlem? Yeah, so the Purple Gang was generally defined as a, a, a loosely affiliated group of young, uh, primarily Italian, uh, primarily drug dealers that operate out of East Harlem. But a lot of them were tied in through familial ties to made members of some of the five families. Uh, and they show up kind of right in the early 70s. And they, they really kind of exist in through the early 80s. And they start dispersing their uh, number of them are killed. Uh, some of them start... Um, merging into other families become made guys and and you're seeing a few of them now that are bosses and acting bosses of families yeah so and, and would not call it a farm team because these guys were considered as i do my research the sixth family and these guys were really serious guys they were drug dealers and they were killers so let's kind of set up the landscape um were they getting like where were they getting their drugs from were they getting it from the mob were they getting it from the corsicans where they an h cocaine give us a little bit of background in terms of the drugs so they, they kind of show up, uh, again, getting back to people that are hardcore into mob stuff, you, there are, you, some people may have heard of a book that is hard to get. It's called The Pleasant Avenue Connection. And it really kind of talks about the late 60s, early 70s, post-French connection, drug smuggling, uh, and primarily focuses on Pleasant Avenue in East Harlem. And it's kind of that first rung of mafia-affiliated guys that are dealing with massive quantities of heroin. A lot of it is coming out of Europe at that time, still even post-French connection. Uh, somewhere along the line in the early 70s, some of that starts to get supplanted by supply from Southeast Asia. But but really when the mafia were dealing with it, most of it was still coming from Europe. Uh, and the Purple Gang kind of come into the picture right after this bus that starts taking out some of these um, guys from the Pleasant Avenue connection. Then you see that these Purple Gang members kind of rise up and take that place at power vacuum for lack of a better descriptor interesting and I, I kind of find it fascinating that they're not a mafia entity per se they're not like sworn in with a saint um they're not cosa nostra but they were mostly italian which is pretty interesting mm -hmm. so so you kind of have this group of italian guys the numbers were pretty sizable what, what were the numbers roughly at peak 
So it, it was hard to tell because there's uh, one of the, the difficulties I had was really kind of winnowing down who was a member of the Purple Gang, who was an associate of the Purple Gang. But yeah. there were there were a couple dozen guys that were hardcore, kind of really connected, and about another 50, uh, the DEA identified close to 100 kind of hangers wow. on and associates, may, maybe similar to the way a mafia family structured for every one made guy, 10 associates kind of thing. But they, they, they're pretty sizable, especially when you consider East Harlem was, was a fairly small geographic area. Now, I heard um, a few different sides. I'm not like fully for the books. I don't, I don't want to give too much away. And, mm -hmm. and I'm asking also for those <coughs> who are probably wondering who got to know this stuff. I heard two extremes. I heard these guys did their thing. They were serious. Maybe they bought it from mob affiliated guys, but <coughs> they didn't kick up and they were doing their own thing. Super serious. But then I also heard that they were tangentially because of the area and the trade with the Genovese and the Lucchese a little bit more. And they had a good relationship and worked hand in hand. So both extremes, one where they were like kind of left alone, but another extreme that they were hooked up with those two families. And I could be wrong. So what did your research show? And if you could help clear that up a little bit. Well, well, they did have affiliations through family connections with the Lucases, with the Genovese, a little bit with the Bananos, not really any Gambino or Colombo guys. Um, uh, but, you know, back at that time, Pleasant Avenue, East Harlem, the Lucases had a big operation going. Also the Genovese, you know, the 116th Street mob, yep. which later became Fat Tony Salerno's kind yep. of fiefdom. Um, so those were the two kind of dominant mafia families that were operating in that area. So... Um, so they, they were kind of independent in the sense that they were, uh, you know, street level guys really for, and then as they became more valuable to the mafia and some of them became made guys, then they start becoming you know, more patterned after the traditional families. Now, so this is where it gets interesting in your research, right? Could you be like an active member of the purple gang, right? Don't worry about the noise. We have a lot of ambient noise. Kids here and there, so don't worry. People watch your armchair and be used to it. Those on the audio beat me up, but listen, it's a real and roll podcast. We don't really edit. So, so Scott, with that being said, though, um, could I be a guy in the Purple Gang and be a Cosa Nostra main member? Well, I mean, technically you can, but really once they start getting made into the families, the Purple Gang kind of starts disseminating. And this is around the early 80s. So as guys start becoming made members, the Purple Gang as kind of this, and it was kind of a little bit of an amorphous entity, starts to fade away. Yeah. However, the name sticks to it. So you'll see guys, a perfect example, when Michael Meldish is killed in 20, yeah, uh, right. you know, 2013, former Purple Gang leader. Th this name that gets stuck with some of these some of these guys, whether it's Mikey Mancuso or Danny Leo or Matthew Madonna, you know, decades later after they were really part of this gang, they're still referred to as, oh, he was, he was a purple gang guy. Now I know you did a lot of research and I don't know. I'm still like, yes, two X wise guys. You get three answers here. It's time for my back number. I know this. <laughs> um, and the edict <clears throat> on no drug was from the seventies, you know, Carlo Gabino, et cetera. You, you had the Gambino brothers, which is another story, but mm -hmm. what I'm getting at is you kind of get, Hey, no, if, you know, Michael Francis, even John Panisi, you know, later and older uh, guys, no dealing, no dealing. But then these were some of the biggest drug dealers and some of these were made guys. Right. So was there kind of like and I, and I heard about Matty Madonna, where when he was a big H guy, it was when he wasn't made. And then when he made got made, supposedly hung it up. So you hear all these different crazy. Can you unfog that for me a little bit based off your research? Because I'm kind of leaning more towards these guys were all drug dealers who were made guys or not all, but many of them were. Um, you know, we're, you know, kind of snubbing the rules, but what did your research show? Yeah, exactly that. I, I think the myth that the mafia weren't involved in drug dealing is just a complete myth. Yeah. You're going all the way back to you know, 1920s era. Uh, but, but in the case of the purple gang, uh, again, the, some of these families like the Lucchese's always had people that were involved in drugs, even made guys. And, and obviously the Gambinos, even with uh, Angelo Ruggiero and, you know, the Gotti guys dealing heroin, um, sure, there were probably bosses and, and people that didn't want that activity that were maybe trying to go more legit or want to concentrate on the gambling. And, and, and I think as um, they saw the sentences, these sentences that drug dealers were getting increased, they probably put pressure on people not to do that. But I don't think it took definitely not at the street level.
my understanding these are some big money earners in the research either individual or as a group in terms of dollars millions per year or do we kind of know some of the economics uh behind it yeah i that that's sometimes difficult because again like you said you asked you know a couple of wise guys you get three different yeah, answers it's, right. it's the numbers get thrown around millions you know tens of millions of dollars but but i think certainly in the drug game they were, they were bringing in significant amounts of money but again, like a lot of these guys, that money goes right out the back door as soon as it comes in the front. Um, exactly. But there were there were some of them that were investing in other businesses. A few of them, a uh, few of them actually started branching out of things like weapons dealing, um, and some of them later relocated. It, it, well, another thing too is you see them kind of moving out of East Harlem in the mid '70s, start buying yeah. property up in the yeah. Bronx or Westchester, or Rockland County. Yep. Yeah. Now. I know of uh, one story that I think we both heard privately that there was this one guy, he's now an active Lucchese guy, he's older, um, who was either in the Purple Gang or at least at the very minimal doing H back then. Mm -hmm. They took it a step further. They were getting it from Sicily. They were cutting it up. They were mm -hmm. stepping on it, whatever you call it, but also dealing with some of the, with the local street dealers. I guess there's a lot of profit, not just in the importing, but between, hey, importing Kids the streets being a middleman i think in that game comes with a lot a, a lot of margin so so my question is for the purple gang in general did they you know how, how, how you know they, they imported obviously and they got it did they kind of pass it off to like different ethnic groups and drug dealers or did they you know were they street level i just want to know where they were in the supply chain uh, both they were both middlemen and uh, some of them did deal there there were a few busts of some guys that were in cut houses uh, one in particular in the in the Yonkers, um that i that i looked at so they they were kind of spreading around they did partner with other groups well obviously matthew madonna yeah he became nikki barnes's major supplier so yeah. so there were some that were kind of on the supply side and some that were more middlemen to dealer side and then they started um, and they also sold to other dealers as well. So they, they, they kind of ran the gamut depending on the person. Any organizational feuds, we'll get to some of the individuals, some because some of them are killers, to say the least. <laughs> but any organizational feuding <coughs> with the Purple Gang and maybe some of the mob families or some of the local ethnic groups? So there were some killings. Uh, well, there was one one guy, Carmine. Oh man, I just totally blanked on the name. Carmine Linnea, Linnea I believe, is the one. I'll probably have to double check that and add yeah. it in the, in the YouTube comments. Uh, anyway, there was a lot of suspicion he was killed by um, members of the Purple Gang. Turns out oh. he was killed uh, from uh, Nikki Barnes ordered his killing. Um, oh, that was the guy. He was. Um... He was a banana associate, I think. Yeah, so he was tied in very closely with the Purple Gang, and and yeah. if you read the DEA report from '76, he's considered a Purple Gang murder. Then years later, you know, when Nikki Barnes testifies and comes out, he says, "No, no, we we killed that guy." Um, so there there was definitely a lot of rivalries with other drug dealers, and, and I did find a couple neat little comments. Um, one in particular from an FBI report from it's like '78 or '79 that. The Genovese and Gambino families were having a top meeting to talk about the problems of the Purple Gang, and yeah. they were causing them headaches and yeah. things like that. But th there were no violence really directed at the Purple Gang from the mafia in terms of like you know you need to tamper that down. Most of the violence associated with them were kind of two phases, but early on was a lot of drug drug beefs, basically. Drug related. Yeah. Now, um, not not to harp on it too much, but the Carmine killing. I uh, and I think it might be causing Austrian news as a good piece on it. I, I'll check with that Scarpo. Um, there was something odd about it because it, I kind of gave the impression he was like a made guy, but he wasn't. He got killed, but it was super connected. So like, and then like there was another guy that was made. It just there's something to it where the killing went unanswered, and I don't think it was as simple as he was an associate and they let it slide. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Can, can you give any more color to that or? No, I'd have to, it it'll, might come to me by the end of the interview. Um, but yeah, there were, right around that time, there were so many killings. In the spate of about five years, there were over a dozen guys tied in or connected with the Purple Gang um, killed. And violence became one of their hallmarks. In fact, when they start hitting the, the media in the late 70s, like 77, 78, you know, they're thrown around, oh, they killed 100 people. They killed 200 people. There's, I, I have a a paragraph where I just list all these different sources that attribute like wildly different body counts to the purple gang. Wow. 
Now, um, we'll get to the Italians in a second. Mm -hmm. but who were some of the yeah, – Nicky Barnes, I don't know about – it was Frank Matthews. Who were some of the maybe the black gangsters or the other ethnic gangsters that kind of dealt with the Purple Gang or at least was was in that sphere? Yeah, or primarily uh, Nicky Barnes, Frank Matthews, the, the black gangsters in Harlem and the Bronx. Uh, I did, there were a few uh, Puerto Rican and uh, Spanish gangsters that – that were tied into them on the drug chain, but they kind of, there wasn't a lot of overlap on that end, at least that I found in my research. And then some of the guys start moving to Florida in the late seventies, a guy like Paul Cayano, who gets involved in cocaine dealing. And obviously then you're in Miami in the eighties, you're dealing with the Cubans and the Colombians. Yeah. The Italians did a lot of things first, the lottery, um, um, prostitution, all this different stuff eventually became legal in part of the country or the whole country, obviously prohibition. But one of that was also the illegal drug trade, which essentially the, the heroin trade, not really the cocaine trade, but the heroin trade was part and parcel of the Cosa Nostra, yep. the distribution of 26 families. I'm kind of fascinated. I would like your opinion. I, I, I don't I don't buy the long sentences. I get individually, hey, there's long sentences, or as a family or a crew, there's long sentences. But I'm struggling, I still struggle with, and I would love your opinion, Scott, is when cocaine hit, it exploded, right? I still don't get why the commission didn't go to the Colombians and be like, listen, we got 26 cities, we got an organizational structure, we have, you know, give us a good price, we'll take care of it from there. And the Italians could, don't get me wrong, probably a lot of warring, probably get a lot more beef with the DEA, mm -hmm. but it got really rich. What's your opinion why it caused an usher really didn't corner that market, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, that's a great mystery, isn't it? They just were totally caught off guard with it. They didn't. There were guys at Dalton Cocaine, but they never got involved in any meaningful oh, way. Yeah. I, I think, I really think a lot of it had to do with the fact that the Colombians had the supply and had the supply chain yeah. and had the distribution already. Um, and, and maybe just didn't even need the mafia at that point to to do what they were doing um how, th that being said however like uh, you know members of the purple gang they were dealing coke and they, they started getting involved in the coke game but it was never to the never to the extent or you know the size of the heroin operations they had now the purple gang um kind of fosters some heavy hitters that are mm -hmm. around to this day i know you touch on some of them but if you could maybe repeat and give a little bit of backstory to each so i want to pack that a little bit too for the mobologists you got guys that are sitting positions that are, I don't want, we'll get to Meldish in a second because that's important. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, if you give a little color to, you know, Madonna, some of the names, give a little backstory on each if you don't mind. Yeah. So uh, Matthew Madonna, who is most recently an acting boss of the Lucchese family. Um, and, and I didn't realize this till I really started doing the research. He's pretty much spent most of his career in jail. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was uh, a major heroin supplier and tied in with the Purple Gang in the early yeah. 70s. He was one of the major suppliers for Nicky Barnes. Yep. Uh, he gets arrested, gets sentenced to like 30 years in prison in the late 70s. Yep. Uh, then he gets out in the 90s and immediately gets made in the Lucchese family and kind of quickly rises up the ranks and, and becomes acting boss. Uh, Danny Leo, who... Wait, really, um, quick, really quick, Scott. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. In your, your research... And I don't think I ever asked John Panisi this, but in your research, did did Maddie kind of hang up the drugs, or do we, or there's some research or some um, proof that he may still have still was involved? I, I didn't see any evidence that there was involvement when he got back out. Got uh, it. Okay, so, sorry. Okay. Yeah, and then Danny Leo, uh, he starts showing up uh, like in the late '70s, tied in with the Purple Gang. Yeah. Uh, he get, he's questioned in a number of murders and called a Purple Gang member in, in the newspaper and in some uh, law enforcement reports. Then he shows up again, um, uh, becomes a made guy in the in the uh, Genovese family, becomes yes. a member of the acting ruling panel, becomes an acting boss of the Genovese family. Um, yeah, pretty high up. <laughs> pretty high up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then the administration guys right there. And then obviously Mancuso. Yeah, Mikey Mancuso, who again starts showing up in the late 70s as part of the purple gang it's named in these reports and then now most recently it was just in a paper not too long ago yeah. <laughs> for uh so is the you know a boss of the banano family so that's pretty good for this small gang to have such high level members and, and then there were others like angelo prisco who is a very powerful uh yeah. capo in the genovese family jersey guy i think right he was in jersey i think angelo he was but he actually lived in yonkers uh, but okay. he was uh, in charge of a jersey crew 
Yeah. Uh, and there were a few other guys like uh, Frank, skinny Frank Salerno, who is, who's yeah. still around. He was in with the Lucases um, and, and, and a couple others over the years. And, and then there were probably a bunch that would have been made had they not been killed. <laughs> so, oh, so now it brings us to very recent and I won't give it too much away, but we can't talk about the purple gang and not talk about the Michael Melda shit. But before no. we, before we get to that, right. Sure. Yep. His brother, supposedly bodied like 50 people tell us a little bit about his brother and then let's talk about the man because the the meldish thing is like crazy but anyway uh let's first talk about the brother first yeah so well the meldish brothers joe michael yeah um i, I first come across them in, in my research about 1974 they're questioned actually excuse me a little bit earlier than that they're arrested with a bunch of purple gang guys outside of a, of a restaurant in uh, the Beef East restaurant in, on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. They get into a fight with cops. One of them bites a cop's finger and they're shooting guns in the air. It's just this crazy scene. Uh, and the Meldishes are, are part of that crew that arrested. Then they start showing up in these cases like uh, beating up guys in Rockland County uh, for the Genovese family. Uh, they're questioned in a number of murders of Purple Gang members and associates in the early 70s over drug deals. Uh, and then Joey Meldish finally uh, gets arrested a few times, but gets arrested in the late 90s for a murder in a Bronx bar and is sentenced uh, to life in prison for it. And, you know, when you read the newspaper accounts, you read some of the accounts at the time, that, then you see these body counts. Well, he killed yeah. 50 guys. He killed 100 guys. I personally didn't find that many. There very well may be others that, you know, are not known. It That's one of the things when you're doing research, you know, you're on, even talking to guy. you know, I talked to a number of guys that were on the streets with these guys. There's yeah. stuff that even they didn't know about that was going on. So, um, you know, there could, there probably were a lot more than, than he was tagged with, but, you know, just throwing out 50 or hundred, that may be a little, <laughs> a little oh, much. Oh, oh, All right. So, well, a lot of people do say if Joey was in the streets and Michael Mel this shit would never happen, that's debatable. So walk us through kind of the Michael Meldish shit and, and a little bit of back, background on that. Yeah, so Michael Meldish, um, again, he kind of pops up pretty regularly through the 70s, kind of not so much in the early 80s and shows up again in the 90s, yeah. arrested for uh, robbery, arrested for drugs. Um, and then he, um, you know, he's kind of aligned with both the Lucchese family and the Bonanno family. And he is uh, implicated, well, implicated on the street in the attempted murder of Enzo Stagno, who is a, a banana. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, Enzo the Baker. Yeah, Enzo the Baker in East Harlem. And uh, Michael Mancuso orders a beatdown of him from a, in front of Rayo's restaurant right there on the corner of Pleasant Avenue. But the the beatdown came first and then he hit it correct yeah i'm sorry yeah the beatdown came first correct then and it came because him. it was like maybe over a woman or something like that yeah so supposedly michael was sleeping with michael meldish was sleeping with michael mancuso's girlfriend or i don't do it so, something <laughs> along those lines but, but um, this guy, I, i'm sorry he was gonna yell at me for cutting you off really oh, quick on the ends of the baker hit yeah so when i got this you know obviously it's public but also got some inside information on that where when they beat up Meldish, it was out like that, that I think Giglio, Giglio feast. And mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, obviously he's a tough guy, whatever. He shot back at Stagno, who was like had nothing to do with it. And the weird part about that, and again, I didn't mean to cut you off, was he gets, you know, he gets shot. He's in the hospital and he's with the NYPD. And they had, didn't have a jacket on him. He was not OC in their mind. And he releases himself and said, hey, I'm a made guy with the bananas. <laughs> Just like volunteers it. And then leaves a life, which further complicates things. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little ADD, but I wanted to throw that. No, in. and correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't he try to push like a pilot of a TV show where he was a cowboy? Uh, yeah, he, he just based it on a ranch. On his I don't know how to find yeah. it, but if you can, drop the link below or let us how to find it. He's doing like spaghetti westerns or something on YouTube. Yeah, I saw some on YouTube about it a while ago. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, the interesting thing. So one of the gunmen supposedly in the Enzo the Baker killing is Terrence Caldwell. Yes. Who is later arrested as being the trigger man for the, for Michael Meldish. And Michael Meldish, after the Enzo the Baker had testified that he had, had just met and uh, Terrence walking down the street and Terrence commented how much he liked his jacket or something, then yeah, they became yeah, yeah. inseparable, which, you know, that's a little suspicious. Yeah. Um, 
But then, you know, in, in 2013, Michael Meldish gets killed. It, it really generated a lot of news in the papers. I think yep. it was a pretty high profile hit for, for that time period. Yeah. Uh, and that's so a real, real quick segue yep. or kind of a side note. So that was the first time I I'd heard the purple. I, I might have heard in the past, but really like, oh, the purple gang. Hit yeah, what's is, that? What's that? Yeah. And then I kind of put on the back burner. Then when I was researching Garden State Gangland, I was looking into the murder of John Coca-Cola Lardier yeah. in New Jersey. And I found this um, article from New York Magazine about the 22 caliber killers. And there's a bunch of stuff in there about this purple gang. And I'm like, ooh, put a, put a little post-it note on that. I'm going to go dig into those guys next. So that that's kind of like how I got interested in this topic. Of, but it really started with the Meldish murder that I was like, huh. Who are those guys? <laughs> so now, um, the and what's what's a little crazy is within the purple gang. I understand Meldish was like another statesman, he was you know a serious guy, and not that Mancuso was a coffee board in any way, but it might have been almost like when Mancuso became a boss, it was like, Wow, I'm, I'm a boss, you're you're you know, you're not a made guy, mm -hmm. but then Meldish had a different view of like, Come on, man, you were like my lackey or something. That's what I heard from. A semi-reliable source. Now, I don't know if you get into it in the book, but I want your opinion. Um, there's some some YouTubers out there, and, and and the kind of informants around the Meldish case, Frank Fosco, etc., and some of the evidence that kind of came to light. A little bit suspect that it wasn't like a layup for those four gentlemen. Meaning they're going for like a Rule 33. They're trying to get overturned. And although yeah. don't get me wrong, they probably weren't choir boys, but they may not have been on this individual hit. Do you have any context to that, or do you cover any of that in the book? Yeah, I do. It's it's really a complicated oh, I know. scenario because you have, and 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 I'll just say I don't necessarily think that Stephen Crea or Matthew Madonna really <laughs> probably had much at all to do with this um, yeah. murder, and and probably got roped in on the name recognition. Yeah. Um. But that that being said, it's so complicated. There's different witness accounts. There's I mean, Frank Pasqua and, and his father yeah. who were also tied back to the purple gang. Um, yeah. You know, then you have uh, Terrence Caldwell and Lindo, is it Londonia or Londina? Yeah. Uh, um, who, are, you know, are, are charged and convicted of, of murder in Meldish and all the courtroom stuff going on. So it was really kind of this, this uh, yeah, it's anything but a slam dunk case. It was really kind of this labyrinth of, of conflicting witness. And then there was the other witness um, who just got in trouble again recently. It was who the FBI ended up like cutting loose. Cause everything he said, uh, he was the uh, Christopher's um, cellmate. He, he was the one that had oh, the story. Yeah, about him trying to... yeah, that's it. Oh, there's another yeah. Winner. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, basically I, you, there are the, there's still the two competing narratives of, was it a Bonanno hit? Or was it a Lucchese hit? And one that's, of the what that's where it doesn't make sense. Where yes. if Stagno gets hit, then and and you know mobs about protocol and that kind of stuff, especially murders were sparse. Wouldn't the bananas want to take care of it? There was a story allegedly that he kind of insulted uh, what's his name, um, um, a Madonna. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, but also you know, Parisi tells the story when when the bananas kind of usurp the club they didn't even kill him for that like that group but yet they killed him first i just it doesn't it doesn't add up at all to me that that particular you know that particular event you know yeah and there was another thing that he might have owed money but i, I mean rarely do you hear guys getting killed for owing money usually they get a beat, beat down or something Correct. so yeah there it, it was and that's one of the things like maybe five years from now, I'll do a, a, an updated epilogue because that story yeah. is still not over. Like you said, they're, yes. they're coming out on appeal with that. Um, so now um, one question I have, and I always kind of wondered this is the Michael Mel, this should happen. Listen, you know, listed as a purple gang since 2013. This isn't that long ago exactly. um, for your research. What was he doing? Ooh. You know, what, what did you have going on? The, the last like concrete stuff that I saw of him was uh, probably around the early 2000s of some involvement in illegal activity and, and just stuff I heard from people like, oh, yeah, he was around. He was doing this. He was doing that. Um, so obviously, I, th I think with his involvement in, in the Enzo the Baker shooting that he was still associating with 
with the underworld. He was still yeah. involved in, in some aspect of, of that activity. And, and certainly from people in law enforcement that I spoke to, that was their belief as well. Was there remnants of the Purple Gang? No. So the Purple Gang really started kind of dissipating in the early 80s. Now, some of the guys still worked together and did some other stuff, but you don't really see um, that the, that group working together like they did. And, and you see kind of offshoots going like Frank Vicerdo and Paul Cayano, they go to Florida. Um, some of the guys are up in Tuckahoe or, or North of the city. Yeah. Um, some of them are still involved with drugs though. You'll see, there's a few um, drug cases in the early eighties. Uh, and then again, in the early nineties, where you'll see a couple of the guys names that are, that are working together. Um in fact, it was like 92 or 93, the Daily News ran an article about a big drug bust. And that was one of the only times in the 90s that I even saw the Purple Gang mentioned in the media. It was like, in fact, they talked about this is the shades of the old Purple Gang of the 70s. Now, um, before we wrap up, without giving too much away, mm -hmm. uh, what was one thing during the research in the book that just boom, smacked in the face? Or at least, or at least give us a teaser that we have to find in the book that when you did your research, and you're you're a pretty high pale comparison and knowledge compared to you. You have many books, you're a bestseller. Mm -hmm. But what was one or two things that you know? Again, give us a teaser or tell us a little bit that you just were shocked that when you found out in the book. Yeah, so I'll do three things. Uh, first was something that I found was the 1976 DEA report. So I wrote this book and did most of the research primarily during COVID. Yeah. So it really limited some of my stuff. And even like FOIA requests, I just got my FOIA request for Frank Vicerdo like two <laughs> weeks ago because everything was pushed back because of yeah. COVID. Was it redacted? It, so it was, the first time it was redacted because I forgot to attach the death list. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, man, I can't wait another couple months. So I reached out to a guy who sent me the email and I said, look, man, here's my situation. Can you please help me out here? And I yeah. attached the death, death list. And he said, um, and for those listening, the death list is when you make a FOIA request. Um, generally, you want to give them a list of people that are dead that you think are going to be in those files, as well as like an obituary or something to prove. Yeah, something Randall, like, Randall, yeah, yeah. yeah. like ancestry.com page showing that they're dead. So yeah. when they see their name, they won't redact it. Interesting. So he pushed it to the front of the queue and there were still some things redacted. Uh, but it, it was just opened up this whole trove of, of information. And, and that was the first thing was how violent and how many murders were number one attributed to the purple gang. But number two, I don't think people realize how many mafia murders there were in New York city in the 1970s. Oh, wow. There were a lot more than people think you think like the 1920s was like yeah. a, a violent era. Even the, the 70s, 90s at a Cumber War was kind of hot too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the 70s in New York, there were a lot of shootings, a lot of mafia killings. Um, that was number one. The, the number two was kind of the, the Florida connection with Frank Vicerdo and um, and the, the, the gun running out of Florida. And then that, that their potential tie to the killing of Don Arano, who was his famous boat maker in Miami, and he was killed in 1987. So those are two things that I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. This is pretty interesting. That was the guy with the speedboat, the cigarette boat guy? Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. See, we can spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> I'm going to put a link below. For those that have been watching up to this point, put a hashtag purple gang in mm -hmm. the comments. Don't give it away. Just put a hashtag purple gang. We're going to give away one audio book. I'll reach out to the person below. Um, that's on Scott. Thank you, Scott, for that. You're welcome. And, uh, any uh, final conclusions uh, before we wrap up? Well, I will say that I had the most sources I ever had in a book on this one. I had, I think, 450 individual references. Wow. So this was one that uh, took a lot of digging to find information, but I enjoyed it. So I uh, hope everyone does, too. I have a question to ask because you, you sure. the thing about you is what I like is I think there's two types of writers. You have one writer that's so academic that you know it's like they don't even talk to a street guy about it it's like you know what i mean it's like mm -hmm. and then you have some street guy who is kind of a ghost writer and just writes whatever they tell them and it's half full of, shit, full of shit right you what i love is you're kind of in the middle in terms of like you're academic and you're well written but you were able to talk to some guys that were involved you, you, you know and i like that balance that you've historically had um so that, I just want to give, give you that compliment. Um, but also, 
how do you cite those sources? Like if it's like, you know, an offline source, how do you cite that? Just out of curiosity. Um, so I will say to the first thing, I appreciate that because because I've tried to write both sides a little yeah. bit more. So I, I try to get right down the middle because I, yeah. I, I want to appeal to general public, but yeah. you know, I also want to appeal to the hardcore mob guys that are like, yeah. well, where did you find that information? Exactly. Um, yeah. But yeah, citing, um, if there's somebody that doesn't want to be cited, I'll just yeah. use it in the context of what I'm writing about. Got it. Uh, and there's some that I'll just put like, like in Garden State Gangland, I talked to a guy. He's like, yeah, I'd prefer if you didn't put my name, but you can quote me. And I just put unnamed source. So I love I've, I've done that a few times. That's, that's, yeah, that's not a problem. Important puzzle for the course. Yep. Well, listen, you got to check it out. I'm going to put a link in the description to buy the book, get the book. Let us know how it is. Put the comment below. Hashtag purple gang. If not, more importantly, get the book anyway. So audiobook <laughs> is great. You can touch your feel and smell it. Hitman. Yeah. The Mafia Drugs, East Island Purple Gang. Scott Ditchie, thank you so much for being on. No, thanks again. Always, always enjoy coming on here. My pleasure.